Welcome to Talking Giants presented by SeatGeek. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, with my co-host, Justin Penning. we got Ryan Dunleavy on the pod. Justin, we only did one pod this week. With the whole, you know, I was traveling for two days, um, and I was like, and we just made a decision. Let's just do one pod this week instead of trying to force something out that won't be all that good. Um, and, but we, the good news is we have every episode slated out until training camp starts, so uh, we're good. Two day, two episodes a week for the rest of of the off season until we get in the training camp. Which, by the way, we do five. We do five a week in training camp. How about that? P- plus bonus content. Um, Justin, how are you? Dude, I was even thinking about, you know, we're going to have hard knocks stuff that we're going to have to talk about those live streams. Oh, yeah, I'm we're sure going to do those... live streams after that. So we the content's kicking up and once like July hits. Yeah, and I'm sure those conversations are going to leak onto the podcast at least a little bit. So get ready for that. You know, usually it's, oh, well, July is like a really slow month for us. No, July will be a, a pretty, pretty popping month for us. And I'm really, really excited for it. Uh, do you still not like my beard? Um, it's better now, but I still think you're better off clean shaven. It's Unless coming. You, it's you coming got, you off. You got to commit though. You can't. Sh- oh, oh, it's coming off soon. It's coming off soon because I'm going to the Dominican Republic next week, and I'm not. Then just, I, I, I need to have my face tan evenly. So yeah, just shave it off now. Yeah, then. if you're gonna if you're gonna, if you're not committed to it, then I, my next comment is gonna be like you need to be committed to it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, well, we we got next week is way too early draft week. How about that? I'm going to try and get a couple interviews. We got the 4th of July mailbag, which is OP, everyone loves. We got a special episode coming out after that. Um, over under. So we got, we've, 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 we're pretty much slated it out. Um, and then, like you said, so I'm excited uh, for all of it. Uh, but we had Ryan Dunleavy on, on the show today. So hope you guys enjoy all of that. Justin, anything else before we kick it to this interview? No, Dunleavy always drops little nuggets of, of what he knows. And then I even like how honest he is of, there were some things that he didn't know, and you know we're gonna, you know we're gonna check up on some things. I even liked, hey, stay tuned for a conversation at the end. Uh, uh, if you haven't thought of uh, Daniel Jones and running the ball this year, and how that's a huge part of his success, we even had a conversation about that. So hopefully the next time that we talk to him, I'll have an answer on that. But he has a lot of answers for some other stuff too. Bobby Skinner, before we throw it to Ryan Dunleavy, we got to talk about DraftKings. Our friends at DraftKings. It's the bottom of the ninth, two outs. The bases are loaded and you're down by three and the crowd is on their feet and the drama of baseball is really really real and so is all the action at the DraftKings Sportsbook for the first pitch to the final out DraftKings has you covered with same game parlays live betting odds boosts and so much more love doing the pitch by pitch betting as well and if you're new to DraftKings you got to check this out new customers you can bet five bucks to get 150 in bonus bets instantly DraftKings also has you covered with those same game parlays live betting odds boosts and again so much more. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code WORLD. Talking Giants versus the World. New customers bet $5. Get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's code WORLD only on DraftKings. Crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. Or in New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope ny four six seven three six nine. In Connecticut, help, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Budo Casino Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash baseball for eligibility and deposit restrictions. Terms of responsible gaming resources. Bobby Skinner, you'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. And here's Ryan Dunleavy. All right, we now welcome on of the New York Post, Ryan Dunleavy, Tony Award winner. Two, for, two quick hitter questions. One, uh, this question is for Justin. When are you ever going to give Ryan Dunleavy the Tony Award uh, gifts? Um, now next year, this year I was like, we got to do it in person for now on. I'm just mailing it to that person. Um, and then second, this one drives me nuts. Why do you edit every single tweet? That is a great question. I am a (laughs) terrible, terrible typer. Like, uh, on Twitter, uh, on text message, not like my stories, but my, my text message group chat with like Pat Leonard, Jordan Renan, Dan Duggan. It's just full of typos. I do the same thing with text messages. They get pissed. I edit all my texts, edit all my tweets. I have fat fingers. That's the answer, Bobby. Mm. I have fat fingers that lead to a lot of But typos. you do it every single wa- time. Every, like, every why time. don't you just type it out and then think for five seconds, like, all right, let me look at this. <laughs> That's a great, it's a great question. You're right. I do it every time. And I never proofread. I always hit send and then I proofread. I are, you, no are you just excited? 
Yeah, let's call it that. Yeah, let's call let's call it that. Other than stupid. Yeah, I thought it was like some way they're trying to get in the algorithm or what, because well, it's just consistently it's every con- single it's time. Consistent, and it's annoying to anybody who has me on like any kind of uh, alert or anything. No, it's 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 a problem. But it's rest assured, I do it in my text messages too. Yeah, but but we're here to talk about Giants football, not so much uh, my quirks. Um, Twitter. And and I'm also Twitter. Have you guys noticed that the video scrolls to another video af- after it finishes? Next one, I don't like that. Um, I don't like but it. But I do kind of like the new the new not seeing people's likes thing. Um, you hinted at this when you, we had you on right after the season, uh, Ryan, about the Waller not being there. It, it was the longest you know retirement decision that that ever happened. He's not here now. Do you think they used some of that Darren Waller money? Like not again, not use the whole ten, but use four to five million on one player. Yeah, I think they will. I don't know when that will be. Like, I'm not so sure that that'll be in the next week or two. That might be right before training camp. That might be during training camp when the, somebody goes down. That might be after a guy gets cut in training camp and they have to win a bidding war for a guy. A veteran it was a surprise cut like yes i think they will use some of it no i don't think they will use all of it and no i don't think it will be any times before like mid-july do you think that there was a handshake agreement between waller and the giants that this would be after june that's a great question i don't think so correct me if i'm wrong you guys might know this you don't have to you you yeah. don't have to do it like that yeah, you yeah, can just you, put, you can designate it as post yeah that's what i was gonna say you could just designate it a june 1st cut uh or june 1st transaction um what did they do they put him on their retirement I yeah they, yeah they, they could have done all that just anyways yeah, you could have done that in march and just designated it for june so no i don't think it was a handshake agreement I think, look, he was very clear with them. I've written this a lot of times. He told them in January he was leading to, leaning towards retirement. Uh, so they knew they operated the whole season with it. They told him to take his time with it because, quite frankly, they know they needed him. Like, they, the, that, you know, number one caliber tight ends don't grow on trees. He would have been probably the number two receiver in this offense for the 12 games or whatever that he was healthy. And uh, so, no, I don't think they wanted him to retire. I think they wanted him to take his time. But as Waller himself revealed, there was more going on behind the scenes last year than any of us knew with the incident where he said he thought he was dying and whatnot. So they certainly weren't going to rush him. They knew it was more sensitive than any of us even knew. So I think it was just a matter of he took his time and they kind of set a soft deadline at mandatory mini camp because that's when you'd want to be there for your teammates. And he made his decision basically at the deadline. Before we get into like roster stuff, offensive line stuff, you you were there for some of the practices. How was Dable this spring? There was a, I saw somebody indicate that maybe he was a little bit more relaxed. Was he? What was what was his on field demeanor like compared to past years? So here's what I'd say. He spent a lot of the time we were there, and I was there for. I think, what were we at? Five practices? I think I was there for three of the five. Uh, or may, may, it might have been four out of the six, whatever it was. Um, he's calling plays this year. So, like, he has a different focus than he did la- last year, like where he's, you know, bouncing around and whatnot. He's more intent on the play calling, more in that quarterback's ear. So there's less time for him to uh, micromanage or blow or blow a gasket. Um, so yes, the, to a degree, he was a different personality because he has different responsibilities. Yes. I think he's very much aware that, uh, there's a spotlight on him now and people are watching his every move and his every interaction with players and assistants. So I think he was calmer. Does that mean that in the first preseason game, forget the regular season, the first preseason game when they miss up when they get a punt blocked or something, he's not going to blow up on the sideline. That would surprise me because he is who he is and he's gotten this far being who he is. I, he certainly has it in the back of his head guys to, you know, tone it down a little, but we all know like what's in the back of your mind in the heat of the moment, you you know, you you divert to who you are, revert to who you are. It kind of seems like it's, I guess I guess part of that, like you said, he'll revert back to who he is. But there's got to, like you said, there's got to be some type of like self evaluation of how things blew up last year to tone it down a bit. And obviously, they did some damage control with Mike Kafka as well. 
I think there's some, Bobby. I think there's some, but there's also uh uh there's also a tendency to blame others. Like, okay, yes, I have to tone it down a little, but as long as I'm not working with somebody like Wink, it'll be fine. Like, so whether you believe it was 50-50 or not, I think the Giants are a little happy, too happy to say, oh, it was more like 20% Dayball's fault, 80% the guys who are no longer here. When in reality, it was probably 50-50 or more in favor of Dayball. Well, let's, let's, I mean, there was obviously some, some bad blood there between him and Kafka. Kafka, obviously not a Wink Martindale type of personality. He's yeah, losing he the too. play, losing, losing the play calling. How, how are, you know, what have you heard about like their working relationship since everything, you know, since the season ended? Uh, I've heard it's fine. Look, Kafka is not the kind of guy this probably comes across in his press conferences is probably not, is, is not, I know is not the kind of guy to ruffle feathers. Did he want to leave? Yeah, he did. He wanted to be a play caller somewhere. It's why after he interviewed for, with the Seahawks to be their head coach, he let them know he'd be interested in being their offensive coordinator. Uh, it didn't happen. The Giants blocked it. He'll be a good soldier, for lack of a better term. Like He's not a ruffle the feathers kind of guy. He doesn't want it getting around that he was ins insubordinate. Like His stock is high. He's only going to take a hit now that he's not the play caller. It's almost like what hurts Kafka more if the Giants are good when he's not the play caller, it's like, oh, this guy was the problem. Or if the Giants are terrible again and he it's like, oh, well, this guy was the offensive coordinator for a terrible offense, even though he didn't call the plays like he's kind of in a lose lose situation. So he's going to be the best soldier he can be, I think. We talked about Waller before, and this has been a little bit of smoke, but then Dable in a press conference said with Dan speaking to Daniel Bellinger. Right. And then said, oh, he's dealing with something is is. I mean, that is that smoke is fake, right? That like Bellinger is not like part of the, you know, the starting offensive plan there. Oh, I don't see. Those are two different things. I well, don't, tell tell us where we're at with Daniel Bellinger because that's been like a I'm random. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I, I, I'm you know me, guys. I'm never afraid to admit what I don't know. And there is a mystery around Daniel Bellinger. Like he says he wasn't hurt. Dable says he was hurt, so they're clearly not on the same page with that. Is that just Bellinger being? afraid of the new england patriots way of like oh you never reveal an injury so i'm not gonna say i was hurt and then dable says well no he really was hurt and it's like oh now i can admit injuries coach like i don't know if there's something to that look they drafted theo johnson i certainly think it's possible theo johnson is their main tight end this year i mean anybody assuming that daniel bellinger just jumps back to the starting role he had before waller i think he's in the plans I don't know. Just you said, is he jump right back into the starting role? I don't know that he does that. I don't Let me just say the starting offense, because even if Theo Johnson starts, tight end two would be involved, just like he was Correct. with Darren Waller. And I, yes, I would be surprised if he's not. The idea that Lawrence Cager, you know, has the had one of the best off seasons or whatever is nice, but that's what uh, Dayball said. He had one of the best off seasons. That's nice. He's still a receiver in a tight end's body and not a, you know, not a particularly dynamic one. So uh, I see Cager still as tight end three, probably Theo and Bellinger as some combination of one, two. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a close to even snap. So I think, uh, Justin, wasn't it you who put out a good stat the other day about the Giants points per game with Bellinger in and Bellinger, uh, Bellinger in the game, lineup and Bellinger out of the lineup and how... Uh, how he's blocking has really made an impact. Like Theo Johnson's not going to be a great blocker. So I wouldn't be surprised if Bellinger's used in a complimentary role again, but I don't think that's using him to his best either. Yeah, they were four. This is 2022 because last year he played in all 17 games, but they were 14th in points per game with Bellinger in the lineup and they were 25th in points per game with Bellinger out of the lineup. So, and I think you even just look at the eye test. It's, I think he just stabilizes the unit, especially with such a bad offensive line. I think he just stabilizes some of the blocking presence that we don't have or do have. I know Connor Hughes set off uh, some alarms on Giants Twitter yesterday when or this week when he uh, like set, a surprise cut. Yeah, yeah, is that based off simply just off of the OTA lineup? I don't know shit? what I don't know what he based off it. My, my intel asking around last week about Bellinger was not that he's in any kind of roster jeopardy or whatnot, but that, yeah, I mean, he could have a reduced role. That's why Theo Johnson is here. They think he's a more dynamic player 
uh, than he showed at Penn State or than Daniel Bellinger has showed in the NFL. And they're obviously looking to become a more dynamic offense. So role, uh, role reduction, yes. Roster spot jeopardy, no. And I, and I love to hear that because I'm a big Theo Johnston guy. So, like, I understand that. Um, but like you like you said, just roster roster jeopardy. That one didn't make any sense. But hey, surprise! You know, everyone tries to predict the surprise cut, and it's that means they're not a surprise if you're predicting who it is. But usually, you see those with like coaching changes, and there's yeah. been no coaching changes on the offense. So then I tried to figure out who I would pick as the surprise cut, and I don't know if these guys count as a surprise. But I was thinking like Darnay Holmes because he's been here for however many years, or. Uh, I think uh, like a surprise cut would be Aziz, right? Like Shane Bowen could, just doesn't fit. You're, you know, like you took the words that that was. It would that. have to be a defensive player. Like Aziz would have to be like, like it would have to be like a real legitimate surprise. And I don't think he would be a cut. I think he would be one of those you trade him for a seventh round pick, like the Giants did last year with Boogie Basham. Right, right. There you go. So like a surprise, you know, surprise trade or, or surprise move off of. Um, but, uh, you know, I one of my uh, I hate to do this, but one of my my favorite things about surprise cuts is that if you mention it in June, you're the dumbest person in the world. But then if you're like, hey, I don't agree with this decision when it does happen, it's, you know, uh, you think this guy's the next, you know, Lawrence Taylor or yeah. Mark Bavaro. The thing, um, the thing with Bellinger is he's also he's their guy, which matters, right? He's their yeah. draft because he's a George Lari is not their draft pick. He's their draft pick. So like. If you're moving off Ballinger, you're one, making the team less talented, and two, making yourself look like you wasted a fourth round draft pick. Those two things are not two things that yeah. Joe Shane wants to do right now. We just quickly mentioned the defense, and you know, we we had dug in on our last episode and we bare we didn't even talk about the defense at all, which is all offense. So really, after hearing what Shane Bowen, his players, and even some of the positional coaches talk this spring, kind of like the compilation of it all. What are maybe some things that stick out to you about what they've said about Bowen's defense? And then also, you know, that includes Bowen himself, uh, you know, some things that he said that maybe that stick that stuck out in your expectations. I I think he kind of revolted at the idea that they're going to be less aggressive, right? I mean, that is naturally you're like, oh, well, you're going to be less aggressive than the guy who blitzes the most in the NFL. Well, like, yeah, obviously anybody's going to be less aggressive than that, but I don't think they're going to be less aggressive in terms of like going for the ball or trying to make play, you know, they're going to blitz less. Is that less aggressive? Yeah. But there's other ways to be aggressive, right? There's other, you don't have to aggressive and blitz kind of get used as cinnamon. Stunts are extremely aggressive. That's a part of it, right? Like stunting can be, sometimes blitzing is not, I I hate to do this. Like a football, like blitzing can be in a sense, a little less aggressive because everyone's going and playing in one gap. When you're stunting or letting pass rushers lose their, you know, contain, then you're getting aggressive because you're like, hey, we're leaving this open. Anyways, yeah, I, I get what you're Double saying. But team- also coaches just don't want to say, no, I'm not aggressive. I'm, yeah. I'm a passive Double- defensive play caller. <laughs> Double team, double teaming a receiver can be aggressive because you're taking that guy away instead of leaving him on an island in one-on-one coverage. So, yes, I think that – they will still have an aggressive mindset. I think they'll blitz less. I think it's much more. I think it's kind of a defense where they're going to be allowed to uh, react rather than maybe have so many different rules. So uh, I think that's something the players are going to like. And I think it's a defense where the everybody puts so much on the defensive line. Uh, I think it's a defense where he's going to ask a lot of his DBs, and that's interesting because the giant strength is the front and not the dbs it's almost like it's almost like the personnel and what shane bowen wants to do are kind of backwards so it'll be very interesting to see what gives do the players get better because of what he's asking them to do or does he have to change a little what he did in tennessee to fit what the giants have yeah, it'll be interesting because there is diff- there is big you know some solid differences in the person he had with Tennessee and John- to some good, some negative. We've we've talked about the offensive line ad nauseum. I, I don't want to repeat the same things we've been talking about, but there's two things. One one John Michael Schmitz, which we actually we actually haven't talked about him very at all this off season. No, we really haven't. Um, but this I want to talk with you specifically because you kind of have been 
you know, pushing that they really view this guy as an offensive tackle and Josh Zudu. I will frame it as this and go from there. If Evan Neal were to get injured week two, who goes? Let's say Evan Neal has a solid game week one, week two, and and he gets injured in practice or whatever. Week two, who goes in at tackle? Josh Azudu or Jermaine Elmanor? Well, let me ask you a question. How? What kind of injury is it? Like, is it like a week to week? It's uh, a three week injury, sprained I, ankle again, but this my, time actually a sprained ankle. This time actually a sprained ankle. And he's not missing the ten games. Uh, <laughs> it's like you guys are there because we have this debate like all the reporters had this debate during a practice like who who would go in uh, i was on the azudu side i think they'll put azudu in. i don't think they want to disrupt uh illuminor for a three-week kind of absence I mean, yeah, his look, development in a spot that he's never really played up before yeah correct yeah he, he didn't take any he didn't take any reps at right tackle during the spring i don't think he's going to take any reps at right tackle during camp unless it's a rest day or something for somebody else but it's going to be 90 percent guard so i don't think you could do it we saw yes he has got tackle in his background so it won't be completely unfamiliar with him but we saw with azudu how you could practice somebody all spring and summer at a position and then throw him in at tackle um on two weeks notice and it's a disaster. So like, no, I would think if it's a three week thing, then you would see a Zudu at right tackle. Now, uh, now what would happen at left tackle? If that was Andrew Thomas, I'm not quite sure because we know a is a disaster at left tackle. Uh, and better, more to the point, if Evan Neal's a disaster after two or three games, not injured, a disaster after two or three games. And you're like, this guy can't play anymore. Then I think you could see Illuminor. If you're talking about 13 games or whatever, then I think you would see Illuminor go to right tackle. And I'm not sure it would be a Zudu to guard. I think it would probably be Stinney or Schlotman go to guard. Right. And I want to keep this specific to Azudu because we've done the whole lineup rotation a, a lot where I'm like, I'm getting tired of talking about it. Azudu is someone that was drafted 67th overall. That's a That's a pretty high pick. And guard specifically, if there's one position in the NFL where – Guys who look bad after two years all of a sudden have this year three jump. It's guard, right? You see, like guys that get paid at guard at you know at the end of their contracts. You look at their first two years and they were just bad players. The guy. Why have the they Steelers, given up? Why the have they just the... given up on him at guard? Like it's one yeah. thing to disagree with them using him at tackle sometimes, but why have they just to- seemingly given up on him as guard? So they liked his versatility coming out of college, and they think he's a better tackle and. They want him to focus on being a tackle. They don't. Uh, they don't think he played particularly well at guard. But there's unlike, no path for him to start there, where guard is begging for someone to step up there. That's that's true. I mean, that's true. I think there are people with the Giants who I shouldn't. No, let me not say that. Uh, there are. The, you're right. There is no path for him to start a tackle right now. Uh, other than, you know, obviously if Evan Neal's a disaster and then they have their own problems with, you know, putting in Josh Zudu for Evan Neal is not necessarily any kind of upgrade. Say uh, what you were going to say, except put it in parentheses and then it doesn't. I don't want to. I don't want yeah, to say what I was going to say. But he the point point being, they don't think he played particularly well at guard his first year. Fans, media might think he played well. Maybe you guys, you break down tape. No, he didn't. But it's like that's if there's a path for him to being good yeah. in the NFL, it would be so at they guard. They don't think he was particularly good at guard. They, it didn't, you know. But when you drafted off. him, you would have never thought he would have been good. Like anyone who watched him at, at UNC, you were like, oh, he will not be good year one. Yeah, so he, so they don't think he's particularly, particularly good at guard. He didn't blow up at guard because it's harder to be a disaster at guard than it is at tackle where guys are coming off the edge and you're spotlighted by giving up the quarterbacks. His confidence was shattered last year. That's not a surprise to anyone. Absolutely wrecked. He was at the bottom of the confidence poll, uh, especially after he gave up the sack that led to Daniel Jones's neck injury. Uh, he feels, I think, more comfortable at tackle. So they're trying to build up his confidence at the position that he feels most comfortable and they think he's best at. Okay. Um, I wish fun. people can see my face right now. To be honest with you guys, the third, like if you get a swing tackle out of the, and I'm not saying he can be the swing tackle, but they're hoping he can be the swing tackle. If you get a swing tackle out of the 67th overall pick, 
or whatever, that's not a bad four-year investment. Like, you don't have to be a starter at the 67th overall. If you're a viable swing tackle, then, yeah, that's fine for the 67th overall pick. Matt Pear, I don't know what he was overall, but he was a third-round pick. He never became that. If Azudu becomes that, that's better than Matt Pear. All right. You don't seem to love that. No, I don't. No. I don't. <laughs> Not, not not for a team's fourth pick in their you know their regime. Uh, I just I, I and I don't think Zuda will work out it either. But I I I I think he has a with his skill set he has a chance at guard. Like he he has fat like fast feet. Fast feet don't necessarily mean good feet, but like there's a chance for him being a good guard in the NFL. It's just I just as someone who's not the highest on a Zuda, I feel like it's just giving up on him. Uh, you you asked us to to talk about John Michael Smith. Let's did. talk about him. I did. Let's do that. But don't forget the other third round pick in that draft we could go back to too is Cordell Flott. And they have more more riding on Cordell Flott than they do on Josh Azudu. Like uh, that John, okay with Flott. Like, okay, he's we draft him be a nickel move mounts. Okay, that's like understanding. It's a very similar thing, right? No, because they're like putting him into another like, hey, here's where you play. With Azudu, it feels like a give up on you. Like, yeah, you're you're nothing, but at least we'll just try you at this new position. I, said, I don't know if I agree with that, Bobby. Like, I respectfully, I think it's very similar to Flot. Like, we drafted you, we we started you at guard. We don't. Turns out, we think after seeing you with our own eyes, you're better at tackle. Flot, like we drafted you, we started you at slot. Turns out, it moves too fast for you in the slot. I think I said that on this podcast this time last year. That was their evaluation of thought. Like, it moved too fast for you. They tried it. Didn't work. They had to do the whole Dory Trey Hawkins thing. And now they think he's better off uh, on the outside. So, like, on one hand, it's like, well, what's wrong with your draft evaluations? And on the other hand, like, good for you because you're at least willing to make adjustments and not force a square peg into a round hole like the Giants have for too long. I, I don't want to talk about Azuda anymore. <laughs> what, what, you wanted to talk about John Michael Schmitz. Uh <laughs> What what, okay. what what are you what are your thoughts on him? Because he's been like a he didn't have a. I'm so tired of like rookies. Like he, I thought his season actually got worse as it went along. Like he started like his bad his bad games were towards the end of the season. Where in the beginning, even there'd be some bad couple reps a game. There's like some good flat, some good, like some good consistent flashes, or not flashes like some solid consistent play with just like the bad couple reps per game. Um, what what did you want to talk about with him? My point was just this, and I made it on Twitter, and Giants fans didn't necessarily agree. It was like everything was focused on like how bad Evan Neal was or how bad Azudu was or how many different guards they played, Andrew Thomas's injury, and Schmitz just kind of flew under the radar. But he was one of the worst centers in the league by pro football focus or most metric grades. He was one of the worst centers in the league. And fine, he's a rookie. The problem is, you draft the reason you drafted John Michael Schmitz, much like the reason you drafted his college teammate Tyler Newbin, is the wealth of experience that they brought to the like those are not developmental picks like uh Cordell Flott or somebody where you're like, oh, he's gonna grow into it with time. Like you drafted John Michael Schmitz because he had 55 games of college experience and he was supposed to be a plug and play guy who wasn't who was close to his ceiling, basically. It was going to be effective right away and wasn't going to like be somebody who you needed time to get. So if he if that's what he was and that's how he played as after six years of college, that isn't put it. I know that's an underrated concern in the Giants building. Is like, is this guy what he thought he we what we thought he was? Like, is he can we count on him to stabilize center or in addition to right tackle? And one of the guard spots that we also have to worry about center. So that's a worry within the building. That's a worry for some people in the building is that John Michael Schmitz is not, did not play at the level they expected him to play as essentially a six, a six year college player. He is like, everyone wants to give the, um, the reason he was their number one center was because he was a plug and play guy. Like he was not a developmental guy. He was a plug and play guy. Everyone likes Thomas to give every single offensive line. Yeah. Every, everyone gives, you know, the Karn Brissett, the Bobby Johnson pass for every offensive lineman. I actually am. He's the one I'm most interested to see with Karn <laughs> Brasillo. Because beginning of the season, you saw some really good technique stuff that he flashed at Minnesota. And team, again, I think as, like, especially with the hand user stuff, I think 
team started to catch on to the little the tricks in his bag, and there was no adjustments to it. So that's where I'm. He's the one player who I actually. Everyone wants to give the Karn, you know, the, with Evan Neal. It's like Karn Brazil. I'm actually excited to see him work with John Michael Smiths more than I am. Like excited to see Evan Neal year three is is the work with with JMS. Um, I've I've probably said this on this podcast before. I'll say I I say it all the time. Like I'm. Bobby Johnson didn't do a good job, but I'm not just ready to wave the magic wand and say Brazillo is going to fix everything and Bobby Johnson was a disaster. Giants have had seven offensive line coaches in nine years. They're not all disasters, okay? The offensive line, it's been a disaster for 10 years. It can't be the coach's fault every single time. It just can't be. Correct. Um, yeah. But JMS is the one guy that, like, it's like, who could Brazillo have the biggest impact on? I actually, I would predict it to be JMS. And he's um, Priscilla's the only reason I have any confidence that a Luminor can play left guard because he had him in New England, he had him in the with the Raiders. So if he thinks he could do it, then I'm like, okay, he knows him better than anybody. He can do it. Otherwise, I'd be terrified of that too because you're creating a by sticking with Evan Neal and doing what every regime does of just basically ignoring all evidence and giving your first round draft pick bust every opportunity. You're not only taking a huge chance at right guard, you're also ta- at right tackle. You're also taking a huge chance at left guard and you're playing Runyon out of his specified position, his preferential position, because you want him there to help Evan Neal in terms of let's call it football IQ. I hope it works itself out. <laughs> we we've actually avoided this question basically all offseason because it just gets kind of boring. But I want to ask you, what do you think Daniel Jones' 2024 is going to look like? That's a big 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 question. It's a very what big do, question, but we're, you I, know, we're we're recording this in June, so What do I think it's going to look What do I think it's going to look like? I think he'll play fine. Uh, like, you know, to Daniel Jones-esque levels. Like, you know, he'll run, he'll have, he'll run for some yards. He'll, uh, you know, he'll have however many, not a lot of touchdown passes, you know, 200 yards passing a game. Uh, He'll force feed the ball to Malik Neighbors. I think he'll be fine. I don't, I think the nonsense about him being one of the worst quarterbacks in the NFL is stupid and over-exaggerated. Do I think he'll play as well as he did in 2022? And no, I don't. Uh, he has a better cast, better blocking. I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be like the 20th best or 15th best, 15 to 20th best quarterback in the league. They'll probably be something like three and eight, and they'll probably end up having to bench him because they're worried about the injury guarantee. So I want to ask you this with with how they view him, because I think it's, you know, I, you know, it's a, because of how bad last year went, it's like the lowest point of Daniel Jones' stock. Um, but they did win six games with all the chaos that happened. Like, let's say they win eight eight games next year. They're not in any path to draft a QB. Would they? How do they feel about him? Would they be like, hey, let's just take the extra $20 million of cap hit that we have and roll with them if he looks similar to 2021, 22? Or would yeah. they be like, no, we're cutting this and, and starting fresh? Like, Are they totally done with him, or can they be... Can they be uh, bought back in for a, on a one year basis without great quarterback play? Yeah, I mean, isn't that that's kind of what they did this year? They're bought back in on a one year basis because they had no other option. And if you're telling me they win eight games, but they wouldn't they wouldn't save cap room if they cut them no, this year. Next year no, they would. Correct. Yeah, but like where? But if the same two people are in charge, Dable and Shane, and they go eight and nine this year. Where where are they getting their quarterback if it's not Daniel Jones? Like, if but would tell- they like want Jacoby Brissett for nine million no, per year no, no, over Daniel they- Jones for that twenty million extra? It would cost. I would be surprised as as of now, right now, I would be surprised if that's the way. If you're telling me what would be the worst case scenario for the Giants, they go eight nine uh, in a low in a year with a bad quarterback class, and their options are Daniel Jones or Jacoby Brissett or somebody of the, that ilk. I think they would just stick with Daniel Jones. That's right. I don't think they're totally done with Daniel Jones. Now that's assuming he plays well enough that they win eight games and he stays healthy uh, and he plays like to you, what you said, 21, 22 to Daniel Jones. Then I think they would just stick with Daniel Jones and say, we're going to keep building it up. That's probably their worst case scenario. I don't expect anybody to have insight on this now, but maybe this is something that I like, I don't know, Ron, I, like, I don't know. 
if this is something that you would like, oh, I really want to poke my head around the building to see how people feel about this. But this is something that at least maybe we should watch for in camp. Uh, a huge part of Daniel Jones being good in 2022 was his running ability. And it was the schemed runs that they had at certain times. Those are kind of QB sweeps, QB powers, whatever. They saw it in the Colts game. They saw it in the Bears game. But then also it's a scrambling ability. So mm -hmm. this is kind of like just like an open thing of, again, a huge part of Daniel Jones's game. And if he is going to be somewhat efficient as a quarterback, it is his ability to run and scramble and even on some design stuff. But I would even say scrambling is more important because that's just more efficient than the design stuff anyway. I'm wondering between the neck injury and between the ACL, if there is any kind of message to him or what is the message to him in terms of running? Is it taking it back, taking it a step back? Or is it, hey, man, we need good quarterback play. We need more. We need good offense. Just let it roll. That's what I'm I wondering. Ha I haven't asked that question. It's a very viable question. Uh, it's probably something I should be asking that I haven't asked. Uh, my particular opinion of, you know, whatever, knowing them, knowing the pressures around them, knowing what they think of Jones, without knowing a specific answer to that question, my guess, Ryan Dunleavy's guess would be that they don't want to take that away from him, that that's how they see him as a viable quarterback. They're not going to tell him to, you know, cut that out or protect himself more, or uh, they're not going to take that away from him because that's how they see him as a viable, that's what makes him viable to them. So yeah. I don't think they're going to tell him to take it. Now, look, they're not going to tell him, risk your uh risk your health but uh they they're not gonna want him to play any different than he ever has when he is healthy yeah justin i got one more big picture question if you want to get anything else in before we go no no ask the ask the big picture question uh we asked this to dan last week but and we've talked about this pod and they're worried about this second round let me just put this out there because duggan listens to your podcast every week Dan, they asked me to be on before you last week, and I was on vacation. So just so you know, Dan, you were their second choice. Wow, that's fucked. I like it though. I like. <laughs> I like. Crazy. I like. I like. I like. I like bringing that bringing that heat. Um, but uh, you know, full. Who, are, are you endorsing anyone for the Tony? By the way. Oh, good question. It's uh, too early. We try to not talk about it anymore because it's yeah. But here, but honestly, Justin, you say it's too early. This is when the momentum gets. No, yeah, for the no, it's not too early. This guys. is where it got rolling for for Ryan Dunleavy. This yeah, is true. Um, yeah. Off season, no, off season matters. Uh, look, I'll I always have to start with in how with my my own publication. You know, obviously Paul Schwartz has uh had does a good job here. He's had some uh infer intel on the Wink Martindale situation going back to the start of the off season that was different than everybody else's. And obviously, I'm busting Duggan's chops here, but him and I are very close, and I think he's had some he's uh had some good insights so far on practice. His practice reports are always incredibly detailed. The probably the first non New York Post thing I read every week. So uh, those two guys obviously are off to a good start. But the the question being, um, I don't I honestly don't want to vote for anyone. I'm kind of and, tired Jor of the and award Jordan's itself. overdue. Jordan does a great job, and he's never won it. So I kind of like him finishing a second place every year, or <laughs> yeah, third place, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, you mentioned we talked about this. Sec they're worried about this second round pick. This third round pick is not playing his position, and this guy switching. Uh, you know, new defensive court. How, how does ownership feel like confidence wise in the Shane and Dable regime? I think most of us are believe they will get four years unless it really burns down and I, I think right I think you should give a regime four years unless it's just you know like you just think they just don't know how to handle a team um how do they feel confidence wise in Shane and Dable yeah I think there's still a very high level of confidence in them like uh the most interesting thing, honestly, that anybody has said all season, all off season around the Giants was John Maris saying he doesn't see them as a package deal. That I thought was the most telling all season, because uh, then then you could say, oh, well, they're going to if they move off Dayball, they could still keep Shane. And which would be know, crazy. You, it would be. But, you know, especially considering you see how bad arranged marriages worked out with like Gettleman and Joe Judge. uh but he, John Mauer will certainly be want, will be more hesitant to move off a total front office restructure than I think than another head coach. 
So I don't think they're tied at the hip, but no, they're still a look. The Giants won the playoffs two years ago. Last year was an everything went wrong disaster. Uh, so no, there's still a high level of confidence. But if all the same problems reappear, the offensive line is a disaster. PFF has them 32nd in the league going into the, le- the year. Daniel Jones is a disaster. Like if all the same problems reoccur, well, then the confidence is going to wane very, very fast. Like, we always say, like, how many games do the Giants have to win for these guys to avoid? And you say, oh, if they win six, but if they win seven. But what we forget, and I know this, like, the the tense buildup every week of John Mara and other leaders in the organization turning on, uh, you know, ESPN and Ryan Clark and Dan Orlovsky are making, Orlovsky are making them a punchline on, you know, whatever morning show. And the back page of the Post and the Daily News and Newsday it has some snarky comment and the giant and the stadium is half filled or filled with visitor fans. All that stuff that you're not thinking about that. That's how you get to six and 11. That's how John Merrick kicks a trash can or throws a chair and ends up making a decision. Like you're, you're forgetting six and how you get to six and 11, not just six and 11, all the, all the build up that, that could wane away. But right now they're, they're still confident they have the right people. And I don't think, a normal seven and ten season or whatever would change that. But a disastrous seven and ten season or a disastrous five and twelve season could change that. How do you feel about the Giants running back room? Mm. <laughs> uh what did Jordan say? It's the the worst in the league. I think it's very, very I mean, look, you know how I you guys know I was the biggest proponent there was of bringing back Saquon Barkley. Not only did they not bring back Saquon Barkley, they went in the total opposite direction where they have Devin Singletary, who's never really been a workhorse, leading a room where the backups have five combined backups have 18 career NFL carries, 17 of which belong to Eric Gray, who they didn't even trust at the end of last season to take over for Saquon Barkley or take some of Saquon Barkley's workload uh, and to, you know, to to help Eric Gray develop. They didn't even trust him at the end of last year to carry the ball. They were worried about fumbles and he has 17 carries and the other four guys have one. I think Jay Sean Corbin has one. So uh, no, I, I would say I don't feel good about the giants running back room. Don't feel good about the tight end room. Don't feel good about this. Uh, the cornerback room. There's a lot of rooms. I mean, it's not a secret. If you follow me guys, I don't have big expectations. Can we force you to do something? If the giants running backs total more rushing yards this year than last year. Yes. I'll have to agree to what it is, but yes, there should be some sort of punishment. Okay. Because I think okay. they will. I think the comments, I think the comments should d- decide that. Well, I just uh, I just saw two teams, okay, for, for Jordan Rana. Uh, Zamir White, Alexander Madison, Amir Abdullah for the Las Vegas Raiders. Do, is that is that worse? Uh, Dallas Cowboys, where you have Zeke Elliott, Dallas, Rico Dowdle, and Royce Freeman. It wasn't Dallas Jordan, Cow- it was Mike Clay who does like analytics stuff. Dallas Cowboys have the worst one. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not saying it's good, I, but no, but again, running back as as anybody told me with Saquon Barkley, running back's a de- position dependent on other people. Like they have the worst one. They might be more productive because they have a better offensive line and they have Dak throwing the ball to CD Lamb and uh, etc. Uh that the tight end what Jake Ferguson, whatever. Yep. Like uh, not whatever. They, That's our guy. Yeah, they have a lot of really good weapons. So, like, their running backs are going to have more room. They're probably going to have more leads, so they're going to run the ball more. Like, if running back is really dependent on everything else, then the Cowboys running backs are in a better position to succeed than the Giants running backs. All right. All right. We uh, appreciate you jumping on, as always. Uh, we'll we'll see you in the van at training camp in uh, you know, a couple month and a half or so. Um, appreciate you, as always. I appreciate you guys having me on. I look forward to the van. All right, thank you, Ryan, for jumping on the podcast. Appreciate it, as always. Uh, before we go, we got to talk to you about something, and that's Dan Patrick. You know who Dan Patrick is, Justin? I am aware. What na- What's the name of his show? How about that? Uh, my guess is The Dan Patrick Show. That actually is his show. It used to be someone else's show, and then he took it over. John Boy Media and iHeart Podcast have teamed up. What do I mean? I mean two of your favorite John Boy Media shows can now be found over at The Dan Patrick Show. In addition to where you already watch or listen, that's right. Wake and Jake, not Jake and Wake, Wake and Jake and Jimmy's Three Things have joined the iHeart Podcast and Dan Patrick Show family. And the best part, they'll still continue to be the same shows that you guys know and love. And I know that you guys know them and I know that you guys love them. 
If you couldn't tell, we're really excited about this one. And we couldn't do cool stuff like this if it wasn't for all your support, support Talking Giants listeners. So thank you very much. We appreciate you very much. All right, Justin, any any takeaways from that interview before we roll? Um, No. I mean, can you tell how hesitant I am to ask about the offensive line? Because we've had the same conversation over and over again. No, I don't want to talk like, about it until the season starts. You're kind of done with it, but man, I'm... I'm worried about it, man. And it, it oh, is I am like, too. But it, I'm waiting until training camp until stuff starts actually yeah, happening. Yeah, you With got this it. Month you and a half. It. I'm not. I'm not going to keep talking. Doing the same thing. We did it through like in the spring. It mattered. Now that spring's over, I'm. I, I my takes are out there. I'm not going to. I'm not talking about them until it starts manifesting. Because Whatever. they could. They could make the decision, which I think that they should. I mean, I, I'm also rooting for Evan Neal, right? I'm, I'm rooting for Evan Neal to be good. This isn't me not not rooting for Evan Neal, but I just don't think he is going to be good. They could make the right decision very early on in camp to just pull the plug on Evan Neal, put Jermaine Illumuna at right tackle, and then have the open competition at guard. That is what I'm hoping happens, and I think, honestly, I think that's the best version of the Giants' offensive line. But if they don't do that, then it will be a ever more conversation, ever long conversation of what is the best version of it. Yep. Um... But yeah, like like I said, I, I've got my takes out there. I've said them; they're clear, and I'm I'm waiting until training camp starts to start talking about that again. Uh, and I'm like, you know what? Let's talk about Daniel Jones. We got a month and a half until training camp starts. Let's let's spec Let's give some speculation. And you even uh, got so appreci- uh, you even you did some investigative journalism on uh, Malik. Neighbor says he's most looking forward to matching up with Trayvon Diggs. And then- oh yeah, well I saw him tweet that. I was like, what? Malik Neighbor didn't just tweet a screenshot of those lyrics for no reason. By the way, I I. Bring back hate. I'm I'm glad. I hope Malik Neighbors hates Trevon Diggs and hates the Cowboys, right? Like I think of Brandon Jacobs on our show a couple years ago when he talks about throwing the football at the cl- at the play clock in the playoffs, and he's like, "That was just uh, that wasn't planned. That wasn't my pre plan. So that was just me saying I hate these motherfuckers." So bring bring back hate. We need more haters on this damn team. Um, I want to be full of hate. I want disrespectful, right? Like, hey, am I an OBJ fan for? Uh, a lot of reasons, no, Justin. But here's something I did like about OBJ: him being disrespectful. Like my favorites, even though it ended up crossing them, pissing on the on the logo or the field after he scored the touchdown versus Eagles. One of my favorite Odell moments. Bring yep. back disrespect to the team and bring like I, I want this team to be disrespectful as fuck. All right, we appreciate you guys. Uh, we'll be back next week with way too early draft week. How about that? We're talking quarterbacks. We'll see you then. Until then, let's go big blue.